I feel like I have something close to like a love-hate relationship with YouTube. It's not really love-hate. <laughs> the reason why I want to do YouTube, which is the thing that like has kept me going, is I find that like sometimes being able to talk aloud about like the books I'm reading helps me with um, synthesis and with with organizing my thoughts, organizing my feelings, um, and like writing which love to do, have always done. Um, writing is like another way. I think writing just takes a lot of effort in the way that like sitting in front of a camera and like talking at length, I feel like I'm, like there's all of these things in my head and writing is another way that I'm able to channel that. It just like, I feel like I don't, I feel like writing is a bit more of a difficult synthesizing like work and it's definitely one that I value more but like I still kind of am attracted to the idea of being able to like sit and like talk because I don't feel like I'm a really good talker um and so that's something that I'm very much interested in getting better at and figuring out what it is that I'm trying to say trying to say it concisely I don't know and then there's also the like <sighs> um I guess like journalistic aspect of like you know or like diary like a journal a reading journal type of thing um that this can kind of be i feel like i've made countless videos like beginning in the same way of talking about <laughs> my relationship to youtube because i haven't been as consistent as i'd like to be this video that i'm making today is another kind of um evidence for my inconsistency with youtube this video is going to be on all the books that i read for pleasure in 2022 2022 i know it was kind of like a rough start and i'm assuming it's because of school it took me till march to like pick up my first like for pleasure book and i decided to go with my second gary indiana read and that is gone tomorrow so i talked about how much like um horse crazy was like a huge huge like what, like it was it was mind-blowingly um amazing to me in 2021 and gone tomorrow definitely has um gary indiana's like streak of genius and you know his weight his ability to like render the callousness of his characters um gone tomorrow is a bit darker to follows an unnamed narrator similarly with uh, horse crazy it sort of begins with him um meeting up with this guy they share a mutual friend in this director named paul at this point paul is dead and so they're kind of like talking about his life and reminiscing similarly with like horse crazy horse crazy um the aids crisis features in here as well so gone tomorrow is divided into two parts the first part is like the narrator is invited to a film set that paul is he's directing a movie in colombia and he's sort of like assembled this cast of like characters and there's like these actresses and actors and um he's little like people and they're all they all suck <laughs> basically like they're callous they're insensitive they are um near fascist you know like fascist and the way like the first section the first part of the novel is written is filled with the these like important like there's you know atmospherically like it feels like something is asunder like it feels like something's on the way that will you know like we're about to climax to something really horrible and so every chapter kind of ends like the narrator is like filled with suspicion or filled with you know and part of it is obviously like the way um part of it is like the racial and like class element of like these western american people coming to this um south american like country and they're in this hotel and and the way that they are um relating with uh this environment so there's like a serial killer on the loose and they they meet like beggars and like soldiers are around like being um cruel and tyrannical with the citizens and so it's it's very much a mix mix of that but yeah there's this foreboding feeling 
um, this ominous feeling that like something is to come. And so in a way, <laughs> um, the second part kind of features as what comes, which I mean, there's readings of that that can be like what is being said, you know, like are we punishing these callous characters with AIDS? Um, but yeah, the second part is definitely more AIDS crisis. It takes like the elements of horse crazy that's like about illness and about um, the the um, the sort of like dry, horrible like physical aspect of the disease um, and like magnifies it in particularly in like Paul who contracts a disease. So we kind of like witness him deteriorating. Um, the second part was definitely more of my favorite. I think maybe because it was like Sada or something, but like we're literally spending most of the second part like watching this person die, watching the characters that like revolve around him kind of come and um, there's a way, there's a commentary on like the way people sort of want to um, play hero. I was actually reading an interview with Gary and Deanna where he was talking about how he he, he basically wrote Horse Crazy and Gone, to, Gone Tomorrow as like um, responses to the way that like AIDS and the AIDS crisis in the 80s was being sentimentalized so people who got the disease you know whether like they were whether like their characters were like morally sound or um like nobody cared if they were like a bad person like you got the disease and you were all of a sudden like a saint or a martyr um and so he wanted to like write these stories that were not sentimental about aids and were not like putting them on a pedestal and i think you know he's successful in that and i think you know beyond kind of responding to that like there's there's then a way that like sentimentality sort of bleeds into just simply watching a human being die um, and watching them suffer and like the grueling aspect of that. I really like this novel, um, especially thinking about it and like trying to talk through it. Um, there's like aspects of it that are like difficult to read. Um, I would say maybe trigger warnings for like homophobia, transphobia, um, I mean illness, um, racism, <laughs> fascism. Gary and Diana like can write like horrible people who are supposed to be like civilized but he writes them really really well. I followed um, that with the book that I think I took the longest to read. And not for reasons that's like the book's fault, I think it was just being in school. The Salt Eaters by Tony K. Bambara. This was really great. I think I finished it being like, I really want to read more Tony K. Bambara. She's someone that I've, I kind of like heard about and like, heard more about her in like a cinematic context of like filmmaking and um, her ideas of that. The Salt Eaters is basically, it's a novel, <laughs> it's a novel that's like very experimental in form. It's hard for me to talk about this, but I'm, I'm going to try. The events of the novel center around a healing ritual for um, this woman called Velma, Velma Henry, I believe. And basically how Velma has kind of like gone through a mental breakdown and she's in hospital. And then it seems like the um, services of this sort of spiritualist sort of um, woman is um, named, what's her name? Minnie Ransom. So the services of Minnie Ransom are uh, engaged for Velma. It's set in this fictional town called Claiborne um, where there's like issues with like this power plant. It's so many different, it's like one of those novels that like does not have a fixed point of view. So we um, weave in and out of like different characters and their issues. It's also like really great writing and like depiction of um like african spirituality um there's also really good commentary on like solidarity efforts um and like protest and organizations like there's a point in the book where like velma is in this like black organization that's supposed to be helping the town but then um there's a way that the men have relegated the women to like womanly tasks Tony K. Bambara is very 
I, I want to say like cinematic in the way she um like her camera's like roving eye like moves between the characters and then we flesh them out and we're able to flesh out the story of being reluctant about wanting change it's also been novel about like change um and so the focal point is obviously like Thelma's like f physical and like mental emotional like change to her conditions but it's also about like societal change communi communal change all of that um but there's like a character that we spend so much time with and learn so much of his his history frank this driver who's literally just walking by the hospital room that velma is in with mini ransom and then we focus on this guy for like pages and we weave in and out and like come back to him it's very interesting i really really did enjoy reading this the next thing that i read one of my favorite novels of last year and also one of my favorite novels ever probably um definitely one of my favorite protagonists that i've ever read quicksand by nella larson i think a lot a lot about how nella larson only wrote like two novellas and i i think of how much of a loss that is because she's someone that's like incredibly incredibly like great and i think had a really great um not just like point of view but a really great um interesting clever way of sort of you know looking through that point of view she has preoccupations that don't seem particularly obvious because i think the way she's often talked about obviously passing is um the novel that's like or her work that's like more well known. I think she's really great at like depicting someone who wants so much but is like constantly dissatisfied. Um, that's kind of like Helga Crane's journey. So let me try to describe Quicksand. Um, but Helga Crane is a mixed race girl. We kind of begin the novel with her um, at the school that she's working at and she is very much uncomfortable so it's a school in the south right and she's very much uncomfortable with the way that these students are kind of being instructed she decides to like go to she goes to chicago where she meets her um mother's um brother her mother's brother who's like a white man who doesn't really want like his wife doesn't really want anything to do with her they don't want to kind of like acknowledge the fact that they have this black daughter i don't want to end up like saying plot lines um or like you know following the plot along but basically helga's story is kind of her going from place to place so from chicago she goes to harlem and she kind of gets swept up in the harlem renaissance and then from there she is swept to copenhagen with um her like white relatives and then from there she goes back to harlem and then from harlem ends up in texas i believe the sort of way the story functions is the way that like race is sort of like made alive by its context so Helga sort of gets different treatment in different contexts but like continually that dis dissatisfaction you know with herself and what she wants and then with um the plight of like black people and her there's like a mixture of like revulsion and um pity and also like this yearning for like something more i think there's a way that Helga kind of wants to be seen on her own terms and hasn't yet decided what those terms are. She's kind of stuck like reacting to how she's perceived. It's a lot more like psychological than you would think. Helga Crane as a character is incredibly like stubborn, incredibly vain. Um, when I wrote about her in my bookstagram, I wrote that she's like a girl after my own heart. There's a way that um, her like pursuit of, of something you know because she doesn't really know what it is that she wants but her p pursuit of something um suddenly starts to look like she's trying to run away from maybe something close to like the truth um or maybe she's trying to run away from having to decide it's difficult to say the end of this novel was dis oh, disappointing is not the word infuriating is like a bit closer but there's a way that you feel Helga kind of falls into a trap and it broke my heart honestly i think it's it's a tragic ending for a character who you know you can kind of tell from what she wants that 
or like from the fact that she doesn't really know what she wants but like as she moves further and further it seems like she's getting clarity on what she doesn't want and so it's heartbreaking um, or disappointing to see her kind of like fall into this trap that ends up being the last thing you would think of for this person I loved this so so much like this ended up being um, one of my like favorite novels of the year I followed up um, Helga Crane's story with Olga's story The Days of Abandonment by Elena Ferrante The Days of Abandonment is a story about Olga who is basically informed one day um, that her husband is leaving her and she later finds out that he's leaving her for another woman barely a woman he's leaving her for a young girl um a girl that they knew like growing up and it's it's a classic story right but what Elena Ferrante does is sort of paint this picture of Olga's spiral and what she does with like her you know her spiraling is sort of play with conventions of like feminine rage and like feminine sadness feminine um there's a way that like Olga has sort of grown up, um, you know, kind of being haunted by this idea of like the Pavarella who is a woman like in her um, youth that sort of goes through the same thing and that woman like wails through it and it's like her entire world is um, ruined. And so when a similar thing happens to Olga, um, there's a way that everything that she's been primed to be, you know, which is a woman, um, as a woman, you know, which is like a wife and a mother, has been sort of taken from her you know she is having to find um herself anew um and the spiraling is obviously part of it and so Elena Ferrante like takes it to like some really dark places um some really uncomfortable places so she thinks about her femininity and she considers like other things that might have led to her husband leaving her and then at some point she sort of finds herself on the other side so it's like a spiral and then she realizes um like that now she's free she's basically free of the obligations and like like the social obligations of being wife and then she can kind of refashion like her life for herself it's not that there are ways i found this like juvenile but there was certain aspect of like her feminine concerns that I was like, yeah, okay, I feel like when it came out in like 2000 and something, like this would have been groundbreaking maybe, but like just maybe isn't now for me. But then I also really enjoyed like when it got dark and like her spiraling um, and her thoughts on like herself as a writer too, because um, Olga is a writer um, and like her, her thoughts towards like motherhood I thought were interesting yeah so this was a really good read and I followed that up with another one of my favorites of the year Elizabeth Bowen's The Hotel I read my first Elizabeth Bowen just like I read my first Gary Indiana in 2021 it's hard for me to like talk about it was hard for me to like write about um but it was so good it was so so good this is definitely like a novel of like manners um made me think of like Edith Wharton. It's a novel about like a bunch of British tourists um, at like this Italian seaside. It's another one of those that like we have multiple points of views but like our main characters and the people who sort of um, inhabit the novel at like the forefront we have Sydney Warren who's like this young girl that like seems to be confounding everyone like everyone's like what's going on with this girl um, and when we're introduced to her in the novel like she is sort of involved in this mysterious relationship with this older woman Mrs Kerr and Sydney is kind of like obsessed with her is definitely you know filled with admiration for her um but there's a way Mrs Kerr kind of treats her with like indifference um it's hard to tell like her feelings towards Sydney she enjoys like having Sydney kind of like trail around her there's a funny part where um these like women these married women are sort of talking about like sydney and mrs Kerr's relationship and they're like oh you know i'd rather like my daughter was um you know obsessed with like a man than if she was obsessed with like an older woman like that just spells out like um you know like she's learning something bad from her or um she ideas and stuff like that um it's very like British in that sense. I just love reading about like class and like manners and like um, upper class people sort of having these 
sneaky ways of saying what they really mean. We are also introduced to um, James Milton, who is a clergyman, and he's this guy who, like, he's not like an upper middle class person. He's kind of here on like a break, um, and he definitely bumbles through. Like, his literal initial introduction is like he goes into the wrong bathroom, and it's enough of an offense to rupture like you know like that he has to like um <laughs> he has to like build relationships with people um and no one particularly likes him because he's not really one of them james milton falls in love with sydney and it's an interesting like dynamic to watch then they have these conversations um and there's a lot of like dialogue in this novel that's like really great to kind of like see you know class and like um what people are learning in terms of like manners. Another like major character is Mrs. Kerr's son Ronald and Ronald doesn't show up until later but he definitely like permeates through the novel as like he's someone that is comparative to Sydney. It's just one of those like interesting novels to sort of spend this much time with these people seeing them interact with each other. I love like social dynamics and class dynamics and pairing like like this novel is literally just like two people get paired off and they go on a walk or something and then they have conversations and you see how they interact and at the end of a conversation like someone might have the upper hand or things might have changed and there's these like psychological elements and um there's a lot of stuff that isn't being said yeah it's definitely really good and similarly to um Quicksand, it's also like a 1920s novel, so changing times, post-World War One. people of certain generations intermingle. When I finished this, I didn't really know how to talk about it, and then I came across like two different reviews, both of them calling this book cold and like chilly, and I completely like understand that. They're like, even with the warmth and the heat of like the Italian seaside holiday that they're on, like the are really very like cold to one another and there's like a coldness to um, their interactions. Somebody else also brought out like the possible queerness of the interactions between Sydney and Mrs. Kerr and like their um, Sydney's fascination with Mrs. Kerr. I honestly want to reread it again but yeah I've already like planned my um, third Elizabeth Bowen novel for this year. It's my next read which is Luster by Raven Lilini. Part of like my hesitance to Luster was sort of my hesitance to this sort of um, idea of like the 20 something character who is basically like unhinged, unreliable, uh, 20 something, older man type of like story. I feel like Luster appends like the, the way Luster sort of played for me was that there's a lot of like appending expectations. First of all, like the main character is a black woman, Edie, and her blackness definitely figures in like the relationship she forms. Um, so she gets into this open relationship with um, this married man, Eric, who um, seeks her out, you know, and she they kind of have like this sexual relationship um he's older he's wealthier um he's white you know there's there's multiple levels that like they are interacting on and then at some point he like he breaks it off and then like Edie so this is where the story really begins to be quite honest like Edie breaks into his house and like tries on like his wife's clothes and then does not realize that his wife is in the house Rebecca um his wife who is quite compelling um chases Edie and then um forces her to kind of like it's like an invite but it's like forcing her to kind of stay for Eric and um Rebecca's like anniversary party and then Edie finds out at that party that they have a black daughter. I'm giving like paint by numbers, but I just want to get like that out of the way. Um, let's also talk about like this fascinating um, sort of intermingling of people. So Edie eventually like comes to stay with them and yeah, we just get this like <laughs> interesting interaction between the three of them, the four of them. There's really great stuff about, you know, 
race relations and amongst like this liberal family who's like adopted this black girl but they don't really know how to like make her happy and then um Edie is sort of like like Rebecca invites her there because like Edie is basically homeless but also invites her there to sort of serve as like you know her blackness is supposed to like be um used <laughs> she's supposed to she's performing a service as like helping navigate like their daughter's blackness it's like interesting dynamics and it, it definitely goes beyond like the older man like younger woman like interaction there's a lot of like millennial malice like um Edie doesn't really know what she wants to do with her life she knows she wants to be an artist but she hasn't really decided how um there's really great parts about like her background her parents there's a lot of like grief because ad has lost her parents um so she's like an orphan she wants to be an artist um but she she can't really like see herself there's a lot of that um that definitely bleeds into like the conversations on like race like ed cannot paint herself um because she can't really see herself so she has these like failed self-portraits um there's also the way that money and capitalism figure into like her flailing um the precarity of like her job at like the publishing place and then the precarity of like work elsewhere you know how are you able to like sustain a living while also like pursuing your passion and like your art there's also the incoherence of like race and race relations like there's a lot that Raven Lilini packed into this novel like, I really enjoyed this one like this was one that I also couldn't stop thinking about for a while I found that I started to kind of like fall into reading about these sorts of 20 something women I actually had like a Venn diagram like I I wrote about it in like my reading journal young girls often like in their early 20s often white um their pursuit of like art history and purpose usually like unnamed female characters um their desire to be artists like waylaid by like their acquiescence to the men in their life and often like these relationships with older men and a lot of men behaving badly like i was calling them like men behaving badly books muse relationships heterosexual like interpersonal relationships and dynamics as experiences that shape their art and their artist selves um a lot of preoccupation with the self trauma and pain and transmuting that into art using the self as like research almost whether they're aware of it in the moment or not and then they're often in like these culture industries so like in luster she's in like the publishing industry i got um interrupted yesterday i think i left off talking about the super rationals by stephanie lacava this gorgeous stylish cool novel i was having a difficult time like really describing this novel the form is a bit like experimental very like cerebral it's been quite like several months since i read this so this is why i was writing or was jotting down it's just as i thought the super rationals by stephanie lacava is a stylish novel sleek in its attachment in the way the character sensibilities are cultivated and deployed on the page not a linear narrative a cool girl novel that's really scatterbrained fragmentary no characters are fully drawn ideas like the art criticism of matilde spread across the novel because she has um her dissertation that's um we have little excerpts that are just like thrown um or like strewn across the novel um but yeah ideas not fully realized what we have are purposeful indelible images the lace on a red lingerie worn by a perfect face mannequin bathed in gold, gold light the bows on the sides of Mat matilde's panties two strangers about to turn lovers lighting a prayer candle in a church he lights the bottom of the candle forming a wax tannin that slots into the candelabra so it doesn't move images are important here for the impressions they leave i also wrote no one in the novel gets over anyone affection is not the thing articulated walking away from someone you knew someone who knew you is a difficult thing to let go of so um throughout the novel and this is again i'm probably going to like talk about this novel as fragmentary as the novel itself is um it would be fun if i did like a reread um and like had like a video dedicated to talking about like some of these books because I just have like a lot to say um i just maybe need to get them more organized but yeah something else um i was thinking of 
this idea of like learning about oneself from relation to and with others lots of heartbreak self myth and um, self mythologizing and also like self illusion self delusion as well the word vitrine kept um coming across like in the novel so like i kept like seeing it and i was like oh interesting it was purposeful um and so i wrote um a word that repeats in the novel is vitrine, which refers to a glass display case. Seeing the word show up almost back to back on several occasions felt like a mistake or evidence of an incompetent writer. But as I meditated further, the word and its continued appearance felt appropriate fitting. Material in the novel, in the minds of certain characters in the novel, is viewed through a hazy, frosted glass. More so, she is viewed as an object, not just objectified, an accessory for the men she encounters, something to prize, look at, something unknowable, something unfeeling like an object, easy to catalogue, to slot where needed, and discard when not. I was also thinking about how mystery is attractive, um, but not in the super rational, is being thought of as mysterious, is annoying for the feminine subject. It feels too much like being dismissed and then i was thinking too of how the men and like they're sort of typified as like bad men in the novel it's almost like they seem to want and not want the women so it's not just like a matter of you know whether they're convenient or seeing them as like a convenience or an inconvenience the ego is bolstered by the power to dismiss to look as an attractive desired object and to dismiss it and it was just like um a bunch of thoughts that I was having and just like jotting them down not a fully cohesive or realized um, thought but yeah I really really did enjoy the novel the book I followed the super rationals with um, was one of my favorite reads of last year and it's Sweet Days of Discipline by Floria Gay a stunning novel <laughs> I honestly think a lot about the missed opportunities of like having read these novels and being able to talk about them like when they were fresh on my mind and i think i still might do that i still might like reread them and make single videos which is kind of like the idea that i had originally like make these single videos of these books that i read and like talk at length whatever that looks like which is probably going to be messy because i'm not very um clearly i'm not very good at like articulating what i thought but it might be nice to just have like these kind of like brain dumps of like this is everything i remember this is all the meaning that i made or at least at that time and then have a record of that and then if i reread it along the line i'd have more to say it's about a young girl um who or it's kind of like okay let's try to finish a sentence <laughs> the synopsis says it's a novel about obsessive love and madness set in post-war switzerland the narrator describes how potentially lethal designs to win the affections of frederick the apparently perfect new girl it's a peerless terrifying and gorgeous work reading the synopsis i'm like yeah i too do not know how to <laughs> describe this novel clearly what they're trying to drive at is it's very atmospheric i think you know at its core like it's definitely an atmospheric like tale of a young girl who is incredibly lonely, has a fixation, she falls in love with Frederic. This is one of those novels that I read and I was like, yes, like this is exactly the kind of like prose that I love to read and I want to keep reading. Reading this like reminded me, like my instant like pairing was The Lover by Marguerite Duras. These deeply intense young girls with like deep intense like fixations and lots of lo longing and yearning that they conceal with like being brash or stubborn or introverted there's so much like texture to Floriagi's writing actually a really good really really good like essay one of those like funny coincidences or synchronicity but after I finished reading the novel um Audrey Wallen who's a writer that I really like she wrote an essay on Floriagi's like writing and like on her books, long, gorgeous, in the New York um, New York Review of Books. I'll actually link it down below, but it's one of my favorite essays I read last year as well, and it was like primed perfectly like after I finished reading this novel. And then she talks about Floriagi's writing and how people often describe it as like icy and it was like i was like oh yeah like i said the same thing when i was talking about it and i have this written down i have to jot it down and i kind of want to 
reintroduce it here. So Audrey Wallen writes in the essay, like most hauntings, her books are often quite baroque, sometimes verging on florid, but they cast a strange spell that causes everyone to remember them as nothing but chilly, sparse, and austere. Perhaps that's because we can only associate brevity with a kind of self-restraint, an aesthetic minimalism. And it's true that Yagi is preoccupied with the aesthetic and the aesthetic, how they tangle together like weeds beneath a lake's polished surface. Her characters often return to beauty as others might return to penance. But when I hear a writer described as minimalist, I think factual, action-driven, suspicious of adjectives, brief, yes, but also essentially to the point, pulling back from the potential voluptuousness of a phrase for the intensity of pure, uninterrupted behavior or uninterpreted behavior. There's a necessary element of withholding. Yagi's books are brief as being plunged deep underwater and pushing back to the surface is brief, or kissing someone you shouldn't, just once, or a gunshot. I wouldn't describe any of those experiences as restrained, but sudden, distilled, lush even. Stunning, 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 stunning. Next up, I read another uh, novel by Stephanie Okava, her second novel, which came out last year, I believe. I Fear My Pain Interests You. When I was compiling like my, you know, my 2022 reads on Bookstagram, I actually only said this from my like favorite novels of the year. But I think it was one of my favorite novels of the year. I definitely thought a lot about it. I think it's a bit polarizing um, for multiple reasons. And I worry that that might have to do with like how it was marketed and people's expectations. But to me, it's a really great story about affect. It's also about like inheritance. And in this case, you know, she's, she inherits these things from her parents, like fame and, you know, wealth and um, also trauma, proclivities, um, neuroses. So the premise of the novel and the source of satisfaction, um, not satisfaction, but the source of like um, enticing thing that um, is often like talked about is that we follow Margot who is unable to feel physical pain. Which already has a premise and like with the themes that from the super rationals you can kind of see stuff in the cover is interested in there's like a really you know really interesting questions that um that premise already like poses again about that whole culture industry is like here we move to hollywood right so um her parents are musicians and she is herself an actress Fresh from a bad breakup, fleeing the cold comforts of her famous family, um, she goes to, I believe, Michigan, and then a graveyard encounter with a disgraced doctor and the discovery of a dozen old film reels leads to a troubling new experience as her congenital inability to feel pain puts her center stage for one man's desire and ambition. It's definitely a novel about like effect. There's also, of course, men behaving badly, which I love a men behaving badly novel. Um, but yeah, also about like pain and about trauma, about, you know, the interesting idea of like the source of, or well, not quite interesting, you know, obviously misogyny at play, but the source of like man who would be interested in, particularly interested in a woman who cannot feel physical pain. Um, so definitely take that as you will. But yes, definitely love this. I've heard it described as like uneven. Um, I don't really think so, but I do understand where people might think that. Uh, the first section of the novel sort of goes through Margot's like childhood and like her relationship with her parents, her grandmother, um, the director, and then we head to Michigan where it's more present. And then the final book that I read is one that I also like finished, could not stop thinking about. I actually read it in the course of one day and I don't really do that, like that's the only thing that I do. I was sick and I didn't go to class and I just stayed home and just read this novel and it is Acts of Desperation by Megan Nolan. I went back and forth on like how I felt about like the writing and about like Megan Nolan's preoccupations as well but I, I really stand in my truth of like this being another one of my favorites of last year to be quite honest. It's so good about articulating like misogyny in particular like in interracial interracial interpersonal relationships heterosexual like relationships there's a lot of like interesting things done with like the idea of like the source of script that you fall into but it's um it's basically a story about an unnamed narrator 23 years old meets this older man classic right and she falls in love with him 
Um, but it's a kind of love that like she's definitely using him and her obsession with him as a substitute for the fact that she feels empty, flailing, um, her own like ennui and like malice um, or malice, I don't know how to pronounce that word. It's a really dark um, depiction of like toxic abusive relationships um, but I was in particular like drawn to its ideas of like um, it's a picture of like misogyny and then it's ideas of like this sort of script that we fall into in like relationships and sort of you know the way that like it doesn't have to be like this but she continually returns to this man and it's so there's a lot of like desperation and frustration that you know you feel and you have with the character really really going into the masochistic element of um these dynamics which are often like glamorized and everything but like really really going into into that um i thought was really interesting ideas of like victimhood and refusing to be a victim um really really great okay my camera battery is flashing that i have spoken too much but yes those were the 10 books that i read for pleasure it was a really great reading year for me even though i had like lols at some point um for the most part i think i really like read and really read like deeply in the way that i wanted to thank you so much for watching